Canadian investors are using ZSP over any other ETF for exposure to the S&P 500 index. Institutional investors, investment advisors, and DIY investors have all been trusting ZSP with their investment dollars since the fall of 2012. ETFs provide instant access to a portfolio of stocks to investors in a single cost-efficient trade. For an investor to own the entire index would require institutional level trading systems and expertise. To accomplish this, an investor would have to buy 500 stocks at a time, and then as the market moves, it would constantly have to rebalance with 500 stocks several times a year. ZSP simplifies this process by aiming to provide instant access to the 500 stocks in the index in a very easy and low cost way. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that this information discussed today is not intended to be or construed as investment advice. Please consult a professional advisor before putting a loony in any of these financial markets. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid back or have the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just got to get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to Looney Hour, episode 159. I was always joined by three amigos, Boomer, Keith Dicker, Ice Cap Asset Management, Rich Diaz. What's going on? Boomer. Boomer. Boomer got a new shirt. That's what you my shirt before. Portugal. See this one, Rich? Portugal. I love it. My mom will be, yeah, yeah. My mom will be very pleased. Yeah, yeah. So I was at a party a while ago. And it was this guy wearing this shirt. What kind of and, party? Uh, a, kitchen a kitchen party. party? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing it. And I said, man, I love that shirt. And he said, I like your shirt. And I said, you want to trade? He said, okay. No way. Ice, no way. Does Mrs. Happens. Ice Cap? Wait, wait. Does Mrs. Ice Cap know what part kind of parties you go to? <laughs> oh, she was there as well. Yeah. Oh, anyway, yeah. Sure this is. Was. Yeah, the party party started in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, my friend Dave. This used to be his shirt. Now it's mine. So it's. Uh, okay. I thought of you, Rich. Got the Portugal stuff on it. Wow. Um, Why is it blue? Think about me too much. <laughs> is there any blue in the Portuguese flag or culture uh, no, anywhere? Not What's... at all. No, I'm I'm sure one of the countries we colonized uh, was uh, probably had blue in its flag, but no, no, no. Anyway, where's, where's that's how you get that's how you get new clothing, guys. <laughs> a new wardrobe. You just go just and start, meet people. Start swapping shirts. <laughs> go oh, to yeah. a kitchen party <laughs> and swap. Shirts. Man, this this took a hard turn pretty quick. It's, it's amazing, hey! You wow. get to know us over three years, and you know, another uh, little layer of the onion comes off. Uh, and you're like, I'm not sure wow, I wanted to know that. These guys are even more cool than I thought. Hey, Boo, are any trips oh, on the ferry boy. lately? Trips to where? On the ferry? No, we won't be going that far north for a while. But I'm sure they're pretty busy this week. <sighs> There's lots going on. Yeah, lots yeah. Going on. Uh, not my life. My life's boring. I went for lunch today with a former boss of mine. Just great and the weather in london has been fantastic and my trip is winding to a close which will make jeff our editor very very happy because i've been terrorizing him with our other pod so but that's it what, what about you steve what's going on not much just uh revving things no? up here with a couple big rate cuts um <laughs> keeping busy on the housing stuff so life is good got baby cut race to zero i i don't have a twinkie i'm sorry i will uh carry my end of the bargain when i get back to montreal though, i promise i think that means it's two twinkies <laughs> that's true it it adds up. anyway steve anything big happened this week over the last few oh, days yeah. in canada anything at all to talk about Any news? What, yeah, yeah well the ferry on? operators are going to be happy we had a big jumbo cut from the bank of canada uh this week so uh we'll get into that we got a special guest this week uh tian yang second time guest of uh variant percept variant perception uh global macro strategist um yeah so we're gonna have him on for his views because prior to the rate cut announcement he had some interesting insights that he shared with us so we figured it was a good time to bring him on uh which again we'll get to we had some massive announcements coming out of the uh federal government as well uh it appears that jt is is still uh still has the seat there but uh, they've announced immigration cuts some significant immigration cuts, um, which we're going to get into after the interview with Tian, but uh, looks like another check mark for the Looney Hour there. <laughs> and he survived a leadership challenge. Are we allowed to talk about that? We can. Yeah, I don't know. I heard that the signatures were like anonymous or something. Cowards. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. 
Well, they didn't let Caesar Caesar. They didn't let Caesar uh, know exactly who stuck the knife either. So, but one thing I heard is Brutus was never made uh, never made emperor. So it'll be interesting to see who who takes over his position and uh, eventually. Christy Clark, cause... former BC governor. <laughs> oh, Christy Clark, your favorite. Oh man, she's uh, she's yeah. Anyways, we'll, we'll save that for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i boomer we got some we got some market stuff going on some stuff going on in germany china bond market uh so we'll, we'll have lost to chat about i'm sure we'll get into a bunch of it with uh tian because they've got a very large macro research firm that uh kind of goes around the globe so it'd be a good time to bring him on and uh and get their views on the bank of canada so without further ado let's cut to the interview with tian yang of variant perception right now. Tian, welcome back to Looney Hour round two. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Yeah, we uh, we always appreciate your time, appreciate your insights. Um, so what, one of the reasons why we set up the interview originally is we had you on previously and you kind of reached out and you said, hey, just wanted to alert you guys, you know, here at Variant Perception, our, our models are suggesting that the leading economic indicators in Canada are actually turning higher. And so we thought that was kind of interesting to, to just to bring you on because, you know, part of our view here on the Looney Hour has been that anecdotally, at least, it looks or it feels like the things are maybe going to get worse. You know, housing market's really struggling. Bank of Canada is now doing jumbo rate cuts, which typically you don't usually do unless you're kind of in the midst of a crisis or about to enter into one. So we uh, we figured we'd bring you on. We're kind of curious. Maybe you can kind of walk us through what you guys are seeing Um in the models, first and foremost. Yeah, so I would say this is more going from very bad to less bad. It's probably the key. <laughs> but that's kind of where the opportunity is. So the lead indicators are designed to kind of try to look six months forward and live in the future. Um, and so they have a lot of these causal discovery mechanisms um, in there. So it's trying to kind of vary the inputs based on what actually seems to be driving the economy. And so what's very interesting in Canada is that clearly housing is very important, rates are very important, but because of the resilience of the US economy, that's starting to have like a bigger weight and a bigger impact just in terms of, I think, cutting off the left tail um, a little bit. And obviously with um, the Fed starting to cut, that's broadly speaking, it's generally going to be better for asset prices than for the economy, but clearly it's kind of still helpful at, at the margin. So. I think even when we talked at the beginning of the year, I think the story has basically been if you were only focused on growth, you were only focused on maybe liquidity inflation, it would be a pretty concerning outlook, broadly speaking. But the the policy component to most of our macro models and frameworks has been overwhelmingly risk on positive. And that's been like the one thing offsetting all the other negative headwinds. And so when you see the Fed go big and do a jumbo 50 bit, and then China goes and the ECB cuts and the Bank of Canada cut, you're kind of reminded actually, you know, when you get a synchronized easing cycle globally and everyone cuts and cuts and cuts, um, and the US is not necessarily sneezing and giving everybody else a cold, it's still kind of just holding up, then you know, it, it looks like things are starting to bottom. So that's what more probably the narrative around what the model is picking up. Rich, I know you're a, you know, this is kind of your wheelhouse. I don't know if you have any initial questions there. Oh, I love Tian. Uh, thanks for joining <laughs> us. Um, I and, love you. Uh, it was I'm actually... looking forward to that. <laughs> well, actually, the funny thing is, is I've been very, very negative on Canada and I think more or less rightly so, but Last week, I was forced to sort of talk about, and I wouldn't say admit is the right word because the data is the data, but talk about several things that sort of are going Canada's way. And I wanted to sort of get your view on what you think. And it's a bit outside of maybe your model scope. These are sort of more of the maybe the kind of the maybe dumber indicators that I look at, but things like a um, composite leading indicator surveys, uh, business surveys um, for future sales, the RBC's market manufacturing PMI, which has actually turned up again from less bad to, sorry, from very bad to less bad. And even the CFIB's business barometer is doing okay. I mean, you've talked about liquidity, but what about sort of on the other side, things like consumption, investment? Um, we know the government likes to spend money, but how, how are sort of, how's the private sector doing? And do you see anything going on? 
And my last little bit is the banking sector, if you had any views on that. Yeah, so, well, I think, well, the negative kind of view has definitely been right for most of this year. And right? that's obviously we spent a lot of time back in January talking about the bank kind of needs to cut, right? Um, I, I think there's a path to dependence here. As long as we keep going, they realize the cuts at the margin, that's clearly going to bring some relief, but it will take a bit of time. The consumer, um, basically for the consumer, the cash flow is what's stretched. So we'll look at things like, what is the non-discretionary spend that consumers have? And that's essentially food, rent, plus you know mortgage payments, credit card payments, and so forth, right? And so given all the rate hikes, if you look at interest payments, that's been a big chunk of disposable incomes, and that's only really rolling over very slowly. So that is where the pain is, and that is where the Bank of Canada needs to keep going and cut, hopefully, like then credit spreads, you know, stabilize and, and things come off. So there is clearly a path dependence to this, but, you know, just like on the way up, the, the pain it generates, the Canadian economy is generally going to be more sensitive to rates um, than the US, for example. So I, I do think that'll be a bit more pass-through. When we look at the US, there's some evidence that the elections are playing a big part in kind of delaying the, the new orders for manufacturers. But the underlying kind of supply delivery times, the underlying cycle actually still looks to be bottoming out. So I think it's probably somewhat linked. We keep going with cuts. The election policy uncertainty is removed um, after the U.S. elections. Assuming we don't get a sweep, then there's probably a limit to how aggressive tariffs and these other things are. And then suddenly you release the kind of uncertainty and the underlying kind of recovery from recession type dynamics can, can start to kick in. That's probably... You know, a very high level where 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 um I would characterize it. Um, you know, I think the CFIB survey is also some of the, the price um intention, the price component is also very, very good as a lead on inflation. So obviously they're just still like falling like a stone. So that's obviously still helpful to support um further cuts. So yeah, I, I'm with you. It's kind of you know, the opportunity is usually going from extremely bad to less bad. Like the point <laughs> estimate is basically zero, right? I think it's like 0 0.2 real growth in six months time. So this is not like a bonanza recovery, but from where we've been, I think it's it's the marginal that kind of matters. Keith, Keith smiling over there. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I like your shirt, by the way. <laughs> don't don't fall for this. <laughs> that's another story another time. is that is that a canadian word i don't understand yeah he's no he's been he's, he's been swapping tried. shirts with everybody it's it's, yeah, it's a weird, yeah. it's a weird thing that's that's going on <laughs> it is a nice shirt it is a nice shirt um so what one one of the themes that narratives that we've been talking about is this race to zero and what we characterize that by or of i should say is all the central banks you know are going to go from you know say five percent is their starting point overnight rates and now, you know, we're talking, hey, they're ahead at the zero. Now, the zero may not be zero. It might be one, one and a half for some places or two, or maybe they go to zero or, or whatever. And it's interesting because you also, you know, use the word, uh, you know, the, the economies are synchronized, monetary policy is synchronized or something like that. It, from what you're seeing out there right now, Tian, which... Which place around the world is maybe struggling the most or they actually need the world to help them out more than another place? And I don't, I don't think it's Canada. I think there is another area out there that is struggling a bit more. But is that something that you guys are picking up on in your uh, in your research and conversations as well? Um, yeah, so we'll have a lot of the central bank easing hiking regime models that we can rank globally. So... In terms of the, the best, it's, it's been countries like Australia, India have been relatively the best. And then most of the developed world in China are all in the same bucket as need to cut. So Eurozone, uh, Switzerland, China, everybody needs to cut. So, uh, so um, most countries uh, need the policy, I think, stimulus to come through to kind of cut off the left tail, I, I would say. But... I'm not quite answering your question, but where my head goes is that actually there's Australia and India actually doing relatively better. Canada's kind of need to cut, but somewhat, you know, in the middle when you look at the major G10 and EMs. So I don't know if that answers your question. I'm a little bit surprised with Australia, just out of curiosity, just because 
how levered their housing sector is in their private sector that uh, I guess they're having to sustain the level of interest rates. I'm, I'm just curious how that's kind of playing out. And and just to jump in there to give people context, their per capita GDP growth is also on decline like Canada. And they have a lot of the similar sort of uh, tightness with respect to house households and debt servicing costs, if, if I'm not mistaken. Should we um, use an Aussie accent if we're talking about <laughs> Australia? <laughs> no? Okay. TN's not playing this game at all. You're not going to give me your shirt. Yeah. You're not going to use an Aussie <laughs> accent. I'm already confused about where my own accent comes from, so it's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, we all are. I have one as well. So uh, yeah. we'll talk a bit more about Australia, though. Um. Yeah, so, yeah, I hear you structurally clearly very, you know, oligopolistic banking system, clearly, you know, very housing dependent, a lot of Chinese immigrants bidding up house prices, right? There's a lot of similarity. <laughs> the, the lead indicators in Australia have been pretty good throughout, right? You know, the RBA commentary has been pretty hawkish. The inflation LA has been holding up. Sentiment towards housing is okay. Um, if you look at housing finance, that is growing. Building permits are growing. They just It just seems like, yeah, they've not had that much of an income shock. They've weathered it, weathered that kind of this cycle pretty well. Labor market is very tight. So um, it's more of a cyclical thing that they're holding up relatively, um, well, a, a lot better than the rest of G10. But could a Chinese slowdown or more of a slowdown in China act as a drag for the Aussies as well? Yeah, and arguably it has been for a while. So it's been pretty good. They've kind of um, kind of held up, right? I, I do think there's ultimately going to be a bit of a shift in what China wants to import in the long term, right? They don't want to import as much oil. They don't want to import as much iron ore, right? They don't want people to speculate on housing. You know, there's only so much you can do in terms of building houses further and further out from the center and then selling, you know, local government selling land to do that. So, yeah, I, I think structurally the, the stuff Australia makes might not be the exact thing that China wants go, going forward. So clearly structurally, that is a bit of a bit of a problem. But for now, like the economy looks like pretty good. Let's Except jump over coal. to China. They still love yeah. coal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. Let's it's jump over to China for uh, a little matters, bit. Right. Yeah. Well, let's jump to China here for a little bit, though. Um, it, it seems like almost every day there's a new stimulus uh, measure or announcement, you know, coming out of, of China, and it seems to be to encourage more lending by the banks or more borrowing, you know, by the consumer. So, so how does how does that work? Is it because they do? I would imagine they have a debt challenge like everyone else that they've overborrowed they have a lot of unproductive uh capital that's been invested primarily in, in real estate and infrastructure maybe that's not being uh, leveraged properly so how does china restructure slowly without being af affected with someone going off sides from you know a, a balance sheet perspective yeah and, and obviously i would pre preface this by um by by framing it that I'm obviously ethnically Chinese speak the language, but I don't live in China. So my my mental model is probably slightly more Western than a true red kind of true believer in China. <laughs> but what I've learned over time is I need to I put myself in the shoes of the true red and then the Chinese capitalist and then someone like me who pretends to be Chinese living abroad to then a, a pure Westerner, right? So we need different frameworks to understand this. Um so I think if you go for the pure Western mindset, the typical way policy works is kind of big bad one and done, right? This is the amount, the markets react, we discount it and move on. And that's generally not been the Chinese way of doing things, right? It's generally been more measured, crossing the river, feeling out the stones, try something, see how it goes. So that's kind of the first thing in terms of maybe why we're getting this waves of excitement, disappointment, because we're used to true bazookas from our uh, Western policymakers and, you know, big quantities announced. So I think that's not quite that the mode. Um, and ultimately, if you put yourself in the shoes of the Chinese leadership, you got to play the cards you're dealt, right? And, you know, if, uh, if you've been dealt like a two and a seven unsuited because you inherited, you know, all these problems with corruption, but also the real estate debt, you got to make a decision on are you going to try and you know deal with this slowly whether it takes five or ten years amortize losses away or do you want to do it 
you know, in one go. And it's pretty clear the decision has been made to deal with the problem very, very slowly, right, over time and try and try to amortize the losses away, see if there's some other ways to generate some growth, but also address a lot of the geopolitical things. So I think that's pretty much the path they're on. So I don't think it's going to, the housing, the real estate, um, the, the debt, they're not going to do any kind of big, big kind of recap, a big recognition, right? It's going to have to just be sit on it for a while. And then against that, there's obviously a lot of geopolitical imperatives in terms of national security. You know, look at food security, energy security. They are, that's part of like a really big long-term plan, even going all the way back to, um, you know, when Chem China uh, acquired Syngenta, like, you know, years ago, right? China was thinking about GMO food security. You look at how many solar panels they're building. You know, the building are like there's no tomorrow, right? Just to make sure that they have, you know, a kind of energy they can generate internally. So I think it's kind of, they probably recognize the economic problem is is very, very hard to deal with in the short term. So they kind of need to, when things are really bad, cut off the left tail. When local government finances are really struggling, they have to step in. But they can kind of knock out a lot of these other geopolitical imperatives um, and then try and amortize the losses away, right? I think that's the default. And I, I feels like can that's ask, the that's being made, yeah. Can I just ask a, just a question to sort of take advantage of the the red the red bit in you as you, as you described, which is, can you, exp I mean, in, in past um, balance sheet recessions and housing bubbles that have turned to busts, we've seen there's sometimes a psychological break with 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 respect to people and how they treat that asset. For some reason, Canadians still think housing is going to go up forever. It doesn't work here. But in Ireland, Spain, Germany in the 1990s and the U.S. And I was just wondering how households view housing as a vehicle to preserve their capital and even grow wealth. And if there's been a sort of psychological break or change in the way that they see it, given we've seen, you know, consecutive years of decline in those house yeah. prices and, and like how do you feel about it a from an analyst perspective but also from someone who's chinese and has sort of a view on that yeah i think from the analyst perspective the key thing is how do you repair the balance sheet of the chinese household because to your point in china like real estate is the vehicle right for, for wealth it's like you know most surveys will put it at like you know 80 percent plus of personal wealth um comes from real estate. So clearly it's pretty existential for the government if they allow it to collapse. So they can't let it collapse, but they don't want people to keep speculating on it. So then if you don't, then you just kind of have to assume that bit's parked as it is. But if you can get equity markets to go up at the margin, that can that will help with the balance sheet repair, improve the asset side. If you can just stabilize the economy a little bit, that helps with the cash flow, which will help with the balance sheet repair as well. So I think that's probably more the angle that that is going down. Um, you know, it is a stereotype, but culturally, it does. It's still like a thing about you know when people get married, they have to buy a house, right? Like you know, the, the the family of the man has to support them to get a house, and it still it feels like there's still that cultural over kind of undertone, I guess is the word. Um, that also seems to make housing a slightly more special. Um, kind of asset so yeah I, I still think it's probably viewed as a store of value but probably harder to speculate on just bear in mind right like chinese equity markets is not the s p with thousands not thousands right i think about it. maybe with tens to hundreds of very high quality companies right you actually want to own it these are great assets you know the chinese stock exchange the average quality is probably not great for the uh the, the stocks listed on there Right. You know, you ask most people, what, what do you hold beyond Maltai? Right. Um, so I think that's a little bit of a problem where the, the quality probably isn't there. So the, the equity market trades a bit more like a casino. Um, so, you know, things they should be doing, in my opinion, would be trying to reform listing standards, delisting standards. Right. While companies are bad, delist it, improve the, the governance, accounting so that it becomes a more viable store of wealth rather than the only options people have is real estate and then parking and cash and maybe like different fixed income. And gold and gold. And yeah. Just to Definitely. pull on that thread there on the, on the housing side, are, is China kind of like metaphorically closing the gates, which is, you know, we've seen all this, this outflows of, of foreign capital 
into markets like you mentioned, Australia. I live here in Vancouver, you know, Toronto, Seattle, all these, you know, coastal cities. Um, his po policy internally kind of shifted. And also I kind of wonder, you know, I hear anecdotal stories, you know, on the ground here, but like, if you've got, if your real estate is not going up any longer in China, like, are you able to really leverage that to bring capital over here and acquire, you know, multiple houses in, in different countries? I'm kind of curious if you have any view on that. Yeah, I think it's it's obviously gotten harder and harder. We have a lot of different capital leakage proxy models, which essentially looks at how much money is leaking from China via the trade channel. And that's still pretty large, right? I, I mean, the run rate is probably $500 billion a year. So it's, it's, it's still leaking out of the country pretty... Yeah. But the mechanism is different. It's very, very hard to take RMB and convert into foreign currency and get it out now, right? That I think most of those channels are very um, kind of controlled, I would say. But if you are an exporter and you make dollars here or, or you know, Canadian dollars, whatever, and then you can just not choose to not repatriate, right? That's, you know, if it's never touching the Chinese financial system, it's not touching a dollar account at ICBC, wherever it is, then obviously that money tends to leak. And so you see a systematic one-way error between the import and exports reported for trade in China versus the, the money settled across the banking system against that trade, right? So you have a systematic one-way error that suggests for some reason, like the, the money is not getting onshore. So it's just, they make FX abroad. They just find ways to keep it abroad. And do you know what the... What Sorry, interrupt. Right. Where do those models look like in terms of, say, today versus, you know, I would say the peak in 2015, 16, um, um, when they were buying everything? Yeah. So essentially, there was no error before 2014. So flat. As you say, 2016 is the first mega one way error. But that was when things were a lot more egregious. You could do import over invoice in the time, right? So it's like, I, you know, hey, I'm supposed to import. $100 worth of materials. Now I'm going to claim that's $150, which allows me to get $150 worth RMB and send it out. Right. That was when that when they first started, you could actually get a lot of RMB and physically convert and get it out through a lot of these. And I think that's been shut mm. down um, pretty quickly. So all these proactive ways to get money out is a lot harder. So now you've, it's only kind of, I think, the export that you can see in the data, right, where, where the gaps are. I mean, it's still pretty decent, right? The runway seems to be somewhere between 10 to 12% of total exports, right? Total, not, not net, total exports seem to be the leakage. It's a lot. It's yeah, a lot. and that's the error. You have to imagine there's a lot of this money sat in a, some Cayman bank account somewhere that used to be very happy picking up 5% plus on overnight, right? So as, as rates come cut, get cut, I don't know where that goes, right? Maybe that gets reactivated again. Ever been abroad and needed Wi-Fi? Download Saley. Tired of telecom oligopolies ripping you off? Download Saley. Want to avoid sketchy SIM sellers at the airport? Download Saley. Saley might be the only travel app you need. It provides an internet connection wherever you travel and saves you money on roaming fees. It's easy to use, affordable, and reliable all over the world. Saley is the modern, seamless way to get connected without the need for physical SIM cards. With eSIM technology, you can instantly activate service from anywhere in the world. No more waiting in line for a local SIM or dealing with expensive roaming charges. Saley offers flexible plans to fit your needs, whether you're traveling for work or leisure. Plus, you can switch between networks in just a few taps, ensuring you always get the best coverage at the best rates. Whether you're a frequent traveler, an expat, or just someone who wants more flexibility with their phone, Saley's got you covered. No hidden fees. No contracts, just affordable, reliable data wherever you go. Visit Saley.com slash Looney Hour for 15% off. Go ahead, Rich. Just as we wind down, um, are we allowed to ask him about the BOC's decision as, as we yeah. sort of... Yeah, that's where I was going to kind of take the conversation. Oh, sorry. So you, you fire away. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, what did you... First of all, did you bring your Twinkie? And... <laughs> um... <laughs> I, I need a trans... I need a, I'm going to bring a translation tool next time I do this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so normally, so I'll give you a little Coles notes. Now, normally we bet on wh what's going to happen with the uh, Bank of Canada, and I seem to get every bet wrong uh, due to my uh, pro proclivity for uh, Hostess products. But um, were you surprised by this? I know I know the market wasn't surprised in consensus estimates, but just more stepping back, it, is that something that you thought that took you sort of off guard? 
Do you think it was warranted? Do you believe the BOC's sort of explanation, which is, you know, in, inflation is back to target and there's a little bit of excess slack in the economy? Like, what's your, what's your, what, was, what was your interpretation of it? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I, I think too much about any one meeting because obviously there's only so much edge you can have. But I think the direction of travel, I think, is correct. Um, ultimately, I think central banks, I think, we need to probably give them more credit than I would say the FinTwit community likes. I think, you know, if you go on, on Twitter, people love to dunk on central banks all the time. And, but I think Eve. with Powell, we've seen that central banks are a lot more pragmatic now. Right? Yeah. How dare you say that? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Chen, you're, you're going to be banned for misinformation. You don't mess my feed, right? <laughs> it's just my feed then. Just, that's what they're showing me. Um, <laughs> But, but essentially, I think there's a general acknowledgement from central bankers that models are not perfect. The economy is much harder to predict, especially after COVID. And most central banks want to be pragmatic and data dependent. So you want to be reacting to the data. And when the market gives you a window to move policy, um, you should, right? That's probably more the, the framework, I would say. I don't think central banks are really going, this is the Phillips curve. This is the, the lead lag. We plug this number and it's going to happen, right? I think it's way more pragmatic. And I think that credit to, to Chair Powell in the, in, in, in the U.S. to enable that to be a more kind of normal MO for how, how, how they operate. So I think in that sense, yeah, there's a window to cut. Canadian households are stretched, balance sheets are stretched, economy is very sensitive, inflation areas are coming lower. That, that is a, you should take every opportunity to are cut. You, what? Are, you, are you concerned at all moving forward on inflation reaccelerating, you know, um, is this, I mean, FinTwit's obviously very, very concerned about it, but uh, I'm kind of curious if, if you guys are picking any of that up in, in your modeling um, as we probably head towards a path of further easing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the, the short answer is I think we cross that bridge when we get there. We don't quite see it yet, but you, I can see a yeah. path to how that becomes more of an issue in the second half of 2025. So we're still a decent amount away. I think ultimately it's about central banks will take the opportunity to cut and get us below neutral, right? That's basically the framework. Um, central banks definitely, everyone wants to get back to neutral and then and then basically watch the data and react. And I think what's going to happen is in that rush to cut, we probably end up cutting a bit too fast, and it, but not overly so, but it just stores up a little bit of growth inflation upside in the second half of 2025. And so that's the sometime in Q1 is probably when the narrative might start picking up again. But overall, I would say most inflation lead indicators in terms of where they see six months time, it's all in the range of two and a half to three and a half percent annualized in core, right? So yeah, it's a little bit above, but not hugely so. That that's probably kind of that well, that is where the model sees it. But the 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 risk is a little bit to the upside, but not overwhelming. Any concerns on the on the uh, currency side? Uh, you know, people here in Canada seem to be really concerned about the BOC being much more aggressive on rate cuts than, say, the Fed. Um, and vis-a-vis -vis the Canadian dollar will be kind of the sacrificial lamb. Does that, you know, I don't know if you have any views on on currency, but um, that's yeah, one of the big things yeah. we hear. Quite um, I don't have that strong view, although, like, Tactically, I think we we just actually start going long Canadian dollar against the the Swiss franc. So cash Swissy, I think actually is a pretty interesting uh, setup. But this is kind of really getting into things. I'm sure most people don't want to to be be, be aware of. But I, I, you know, I, I so think wait a second. You want to go long a badly run country and short a very well run country with a ten percent uh, current account balance uh, surplus? Sorry. <laughs> Tactical trade, you know, yeah, that's the that's the setup. Okay. The, the bet is that kind of the growth is probably not as bad as everyone thinks, and the SMB is talked about intervening, but they're not quite ready. You're getting a, it's gone nowhere for a while, so you, you know it's just stuck. Okay. I think it's essentially we want to be short Swiss franc, but you're running out of different ways to. It's Got a it. question what leg you use. So we've been long dollar against Swissy and that's worked quite well, but that's that's gone up so much that we need the next next leg. And I feel like the Canada recession story is a little bit stale now. Like at the beginning of the year, I think it was very clean and there wasn't any turn in the lead indicators. But now it's almost a year. 
you look at small business delinquencies that's starting to peak the the BOC's kind of business outlook they're bad but you know as we discussed going from terrible to less bad they're all starting to kind of bottom out effectively so so just a very back. rosy picture for Canada and um and I guess we'll have Rosie to we'll bring you work. back. <laughs> we'll like bring there's, you a, back. there's a macro trading opportunity. You guys are experts okay. on what is going I mean, on on the ground. So I, got I don't more. want to comment even further than six months. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I got one more sort of question for you as we as we get near wrapping this up. But um, you know, you guys had some really good calls. I've been I'm following your work for for quite a while this year, and uh, I know more recently, uh, you know, tactically you were um, um, watching the bond market. And, uh, you know, calling for higher yields pretty much, you know, across the curve and, and, and that sort of transpired. Do you, where do you see things today and, and kind of moving forward, say, you know, several months from now, um, obviously, you know, again, I'm speaking from a Canadian's perspective, everybody, everybody in Canada has been watching the bond market, you know, Hey, the BLC is cutting, but you know, yields are actually pushing higher and that's pushing mortgage rates actually higher, not lower. Um, which is not what everybody is really hoping for. So I'm kind of curious tactically where you're where you're seeing things moving forward. I, I think from so you know with US ten year four point two, it kind of feels about fair, right? Obviously, it's hard to know how much is just people getting ahead of the Trump winning the election, um, uh, kind of trade. But it feels like that that's kind of where you know most of the fair values are. I would say our fair value for US ten years around four. Um, so I don't think, I, I don't see a huge amount of edge, right? Like to a point it's played out. We've taken almost everything off. We think most of the economy is positive. U S economy is positive, but below trend growth. So call it somewhere between one and a half to 2% real. It's not that exciting. It's not that amazing for, uh, you know, equity earnings growth, but it didn't justify so many cuts priced in 2025 for the fed. So now that that's kind of normalized. I'm actually kind of just in more of a way and see, like, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen in the election. It's probably a toss up with, with it, you know, we'll, we'll know soon enough. But I do think most central banks are in that mode where if there's an opportunity to cut, they should take it. They should err on the side of cutting off the left tail. But to your point and the, the, the question a bit earlier, I think by Q1 next year, there might be a realization that they've, they've got to where they want to be in terms of got the cuts in and they want to be way and see. And from that moment is where maybe the, the next leg of kind of, you know, the curve steepening, the long end yields going higher can, 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 can continue. So that's kind of a kind of little bit what I'm looking for, but it's too hard, right? Who knows? Like, depending on the election, if we get a red sweep, blue sweep, like, you know, tariffs, you know, Trump, is he going to do what he says? Like, I, I'm much rather just wait. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, right? It's too, it's too hard. Yeah. Cool. Well, cool. Unlike our Thank YouTube you. comments where everybody knows, but uh, we, <laughs> we do appreciate Jan, you coming on second appearance. Um, we'll have to kind of revisit this conversation in 2025 for the, uh, for the three feet, but uh, yeah, we appreciate your, your insights here uh, for those that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll link to variant perception in the show notes as well. Uh, fantastic research. We've got a lot of a uh, very smart people that tune into the show. So um, yeah, thanks again for taking the time. No, thanks for having me. This is one of the most fun podcasts I go on because the, the joke per minute ratio is very high. I feel. <laughs> That's mostly Keith stealing people's shirts. <laughs> it's it's fun. Thank you for coming on again. 18 minutes. <laughs> that was a great uh, great interview with Tian. Uh, Keith, as you mentioned, he's a institutional type strategist, right? So it's... Um... You know, those are typically the clientele, but I think it, it, you know, gives hopefully our listeners just a general view of, of kind of how these big institutions are thinking and, 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 um, yeah, it'll be interesting to sort of see. But he had, he had two really interesting points. I mean, first of all, he was not at all willing to trade shirts with me. So that's a disappointment. You have to agree. <laughs> uh, but the other interesting, uh, you know, observation to, to pick up with his comment about, China and what their strategy is with the reaction and that it, you know, what I heard from this was really the European response after the U S housing crisis. And the European response was don't write off anything. We're just going to slow walk this for a long time. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll get out of this. 
But after the U.S. housing crisis, remember, it was the Chinese that really helped re-stimulate the world right. again. Yeah. So if, if the world does roll over into something a, a bit less attractive right now, it, maybe it's not the Chinese who can help pull everyone out of it. So maybe it, it does fall back to the U.S. And I no doubt that there could be a lot of American stimulus coming up here in in, in 25. But that, that's the two main things uh, that I noticed from the conversation. Yeah, yeah, I picked up on that too, actually. And I think it's actually, in a, in a way, I was actually kind of disheartened to hear that. Because I think one of the real successes of America's policy during the housing bubble was that they wrote off so much of the debt and they just sort of ate it. Now, don't get me wrong. It was obviously a very painful, painful time for the U.S. economy and the global economy. But I think that's one of the problems with the Japanese model, which is what I think Tian was sort of alluding to China would go down. And that's how they, instead of writing down these bad debts or bad loans, that they would sort of just muddle along. And as Keith said, that's what the Europeans did. And that's why I think it took forever for them to sort of sort of get out of it. And you could argue that in some countries they haven't gotten out of it. So I, that was this that was the piece that I thought was quite bad. I also am quite disappointed that he didn't want to eat a Twinkie. But maybe next time we'll get it. We'll get him to do it. But I don't think he was a little bit confused, truthfully. But, yeah, he uh, was a bit confused. <laughs> well, <laughs> in his your fairness, who, who wouldn't be confused if yeah, you're a, a right. pop-on guest in the loony hour? Yeah. Uh, yeah what else you right. got, Steve? What else are we going to uh, jump just, into? Yeah, I mean, just more the Bank of Canada, you know, just watching the press conference. Uh, you know, I wasn't going to bug Tian if he was pulling up his laptop to watch uh, Tiff Macklem live, you know, a couple days ago. I'm sure he had better things to do, but, uh, but we did. And um, That's right. Yeah, I, I just thought i think one of the things that i found interesting was you know based on sort of the boc's projections is that they were pretty emphatic about they see more cuts coming um assuming yeah they were very dovish yeah it was a very dovish keith rich i don't know if you guys had any comments i've I've definitely got a few more but you guys can jump in yeah i'll go first first of all uh do they do their own speech writing or do they have a (laughs) team for it What, what do you think it is a team surely Okay. I mean, for us, like Steve writes all of our funny jokes. That's why we sound cool. Uh, but for for Tiff to, you know, and you, everyone's seen the headline, but now, you know, he basically slammed the table and said, we're going to stick the landing, you know, which is yeah. with a reference, of course, to a hard, hard or soft landing. And you have some gymnastics, you know, overturns with it. Uh, but stick the landing. I'm thinking of Mary Lou Retton. So you guys may not know that name, but she was this American gymnast at the 84 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, and she could stick the landing. She won all the gold medals and everything. So if they're trying to do a stick the landing Mary Lou Retton style, they could do it. However, here's the caveat. Guess who did not attend the 84 Olympics? Mary Lou? No, she was there, Rich. She won all the gold medals. <laughs> oh, the Russians. The Russians didn't attend. The yes, the Soviet, the commies they did not. It. The commies boycotted. Boycott yeah, it. so I don't think right now Tiff is maybe uh, appreciating the impact of the of the commies around the world and how it's affecting uh, his monetary policy relative to fiscal, because that's the real challenge that we continue to have coming up here. That's the first. Uh, you know, comment on, on the 50 basis points. What did you think, Rich, when, when you saw the, the presser and everything? I just thought it was, um, I, I thought the stick the landing thing was the, the trifecta. So my mother always says, you know, there isn't two without three. And I think this will be his legacy. Three absolutely terrible takes as the central bank governor. And the first was inflation will be transitory, which it was not that interest rates would be low for a very long time. And then now to to cap off his tenure, as my view, very quite dubious tenure as a Bank of Canada governor is stick the landing. And I think it's um, really interesting. The reason I, I bring that up is because he also talked about something called excess s- supplies, what they called it. And then I think he alluded to the fact that there was slack in the labor market. Yeah. But I thought it was, again, this is an unprecedented move. I think what we... You know, I think people are sort of forgetting that, you know, we would 25, 25, 25 and 50 um, at a time when, yes, inflation is low and at target. But, you know, 
in the same breath, he talks about how investment sentiment is basically bottomed out. Consumers are under a lot of trouble. Unemployment rates are rising. Like he listed all of these things that are, are really, really bad. And then he says, but we're going to stick the landing. And so I just thought that, that was kind of an interesting. Um, it, it just didn't seem consistent is how I would say. So I got go ahead, Steve. Pers perspective here. I just, uh, you know, post um, BOC, obviously, you know, you know, the reporters start calling and yeah, I had some some Bloomberg guys calling and saying, well, you know, the one thing that we noticed was that the BOC's monetary policy report is really forecasting a large pickup in residential investment. So we want to get, you know, your perspective on housing and, and kind of what you're seeing. And so the BOC uh, sees growth in residential investment to rise around 6% in 2025 and 2026. They particularly know resales and renovations uh, are anticipated to recover as interest rates decline. So like it almost like seems like they're cutting rates in hopes that they can re-stimulate the housing market to, to drive growth. And so I just think it's such an important context, whether or not they're successful in that. I just think it's important context that it seems like we're kind of going back to the well, right? We're going back to the well, which is what did we see over the last two to three weeks? We saw the finance minister, Krista Freeland, come out and say, we're going to make borrowing easier. We're going to allow you to borrow more money through CMHC, you know, $1.5 million dollars. Then you have the Bank of Canada come out 50 basis point cut and say, yeah, we were really leaning and hoping that residential investment increases and grows. And so to me, it's like, yeah, you're going back to the well and uh, you're trying to sort of re-stimulate the, the housing market. So, I, I mean, we'll see. We'll see if they're successful in that or not. I still think there's a lot of challenges that we're facing ahead. But, uh, you know, the animal spirits in Canada are significant. Uh, when it comes to housing. And so I can never count it, it out. It, yeah. You know what? Like I keep going back to the only time you do a 50 basis point cut in a single meeting for everyone. So not like multiple 25s, a single meeting, boom, you do 50 is when there's a crisis of some sort. So in, in Canada, so the last four times we had this happen, it was during uh, in response to 9-11, uh, September 11th. And then in response to the U.S. housing crisis, and then in response to the COVID pandemic, and now today in response to a return to normalcy, apparently. That's the reason <laughs> to do it. Sticking the landing. <laughs> Sticking the landing. That's why we need to do 50 here. And and, and again, I'm, you know, I, I've had a lot of success doing things just by being skeptical when you need to be skeptical. And I keep going back to this. This is a bit odd right now. So even going into the meeting, CRBC, uh, CRBC, they even suggested that maybe they should do 75 basis points. You know, it, again, it's just very odd behavior. So just to set everyone up for the next meeting, which is uh, December the 11th. Uh, right now, the market is expecting a 37 basis point cut. Now, obviously, they go oh, in 30, yeah, of, 37. So they're kind of split between 25, 50, basically, at this point. Yeah, 25 is in the bag. And I suspect if we get a couple more dovish data points coming out, uh, you could see another another 50 here. But, you know, we have one meeting left before year end. And I continue to see this as this race to the bottom because even, even the Europeans this week, you know, they were expected to do 25 at their next meeting, which is, uh, I don't know, coming up soon in, in December for them. And uh, now all of a sudden, like immediately over the last 48 hours, now you're starting to see even more suggestions from uh, governing council members <clears throat> that maybe, you know, growth is going to be even weaker than there. So now they're positioning for a jumbo. So jumbo is the new, the new normal. what? The new normal? <laughs> jumbo is normal. Jumbo is normal. Yeah, jumbo I mean, <laughs> just, I just think it was a very, it was weird to be so dovish and yet be so optimistic just to marry your, both of your points of view, Keith and Steve, which is, it's not just the residential um, investment that's going to just miraculously pick up. Um. It's going to be the other non so non resi investment is expected to pick up. Okay, um, I don't know who would want to in this sort of regulatory and political environment, but I could be wrong about that. Um, and then at the same time, just being so dovish, being worried, you know, that there's excess slack. I just, I, 
it was just it was just an odd one. I think we'll look back and think that this is quite an odd thing to to marry. What one of the best of... questions? One of the best questions, though, uh, I forget who who asked the question, but they said, uh, you know, are, can you try to be more uh, provide more visibility, me, and be more oh, yeah. clear with yeah, yeah, with one. your future direction for policy changes? And you know, they were a bit offended with that question. Yeah, and I'm and I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Oh man, back in 2020, you were you were the most clear you could ever be saying rates will never go higher again until was it 25 or 25, 23? Yeah. yeah, it was something like that. But anyway, he did not reference that moment in time. Instead, he referenced another moment six months ago when they said, Yeah, they might get they might cut rates. But these guys guys, central bankers have feelings too. So you gotta be be mindful of that. Well, uh um... I mean, it is a hard job. Sorry, one last thing. It is a hard job. I'm not saying I'm like, you know, we make it sound like it's easy. I just it's the level of confidence that I'm always very mystified by. Sorry. So well, I just want to yeah, I just want to reemphasize something just because, you know, I, I deal with, you know, housing on a day to day basis and, you know, it's just normal home buyers and home sellers. You know, it's not people that are focused on the bond market and you know, people that know who Tiff Macklin is. They just read the Globe and Mail headline article that says, you know, jumbo jumbo cut is the. Jumbo is normal, um, you know, 50 basis points. And everybody just assumes that it automatically means lower mortgage rates. So everybody, so I think we're going to see, like, I think over, I can tell you this, over the last three, four weeks, we've seen a noticeable increase in, in resale housing activity. Um, you know, rates have come down quite a bit. But on the on the mortgage rate side, People just need to I just want to reemphasize that when the Bank of Canada cuts 50 basis points as they did, it only changes the variable rate mortgage. So it brought the prime rate down. So your variable rate mortgage today is about 5%. That's kind of what most people are going to get. They're, you're about 5% today. Your fixed rates today are kind of in the low fours. So, and those didn't move. Bond yields were actually up on the day that the BOC cut. So, don't automatically assume that when the Bank of Canada cuts, your mortgage is going to get cheaper. Um, and that's why I was bugging Tian there at the at the end of the interview about his view on 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 yields and where they're going. It's you know we could get another fifty from the BOC in December, and you could have no change in in fixed rate mortgages. So I just think that's important context because you know I don't want people going out there and speculate on housing, assuming that you know fixed rates are coming down into the low threes or something like that. And everyone that what Steve is referencing in our world is credit spreads. So when we talk about credit spreads, that's exactly what what you're referencing as, as well, Steve. It's a really good point. So anything else happen this week? Drop from... roll. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, we had our our good friend of the show Ben Rabido, who's uh, hosting the next live Looney Hour event at his cabin. Um, Yay! <laughs> thanks, Ben. Appreciate it, man. Uh, yeah, he's been, he's been all over the BOC. Uh, you know, he's, he's kind of won the Twinkie bat. We're are hoping to have him on for, uh, the next meeting in December. So I've just RSVP would him while he's listening to this, but, um, <laughs> he's also been all over the immigration file. And so yesterday we had a leak that the federal government, the Trudeau government, uh, is announcing a reduction to the permanent resident growth in 2025 and 2026. And so it's significant. Now, keep in mind, we've talked about on the show, they've already announced changes and limitations to the non-permanent resident cohort, which is really where all the large growth has come from, right? It's come from these shady schools, um, these large corporations, Tim Hortons, Canadian Tire, uh, that are taking advantage of temporary foreign worker programs. And that's how our population growth got out of control. So the, the federal government has already said, listen, we're going to dial that back down so that cohort becomes, what is it, like 5% of the of the total population from, I think, where is it today, Rich? In, in, in the sixes, I believe. Oh, oh man. I don't know. So anyways, I'm, I'm probably butchering this a little bit. Sorry. But what they, what they never did is they never changed the number of permanent residents. So now what they're doing, yeah. they've come out and said, we're going to lower the number of permanent residents. So initially in 2025, the target was 500,000. So they've just lowered it um, to what looks to be about four, 395,000 rich. Mm -hmm. um, yep, yep. So it's, a, it's a big change. And what it, when you actually, we had um, 
we had two sources today. So we had Mike Moffat come out, crunch the numbers, and we had Ben kind of confirm those numbers. Um, but assuming there's a lot of ifs in this, but assuming that the Trudeau government is obviously in power, number one, uh, but number two is they actually follow through with all their promises, you'll actually see population growth decline in 25 and 26. Whoa. I will. I, I, yeah, I don't buy that for a second. Man, I got to think of something bigger than a Twinkie to bet. <laughs> I mean, I obviously I trust Mike Moffat and Brad Rabideau has been on this as, as well as Jesus, as, as good as anyone possibly can. I just think implement it, we've it's this government has demonstrated that execution is, is not exactly their forte um, over and over and over again. And I guess um, I'll see it when I believe it would be my maybe not. But such let, a good let's talk instead then. Conversation. Yeah. So let's let's for talk. I know Rich has to run here real quick here. Uh, let, let's talk instead that this is what happens. So what what is the impact, Steve, in your world in housing immediately? I, I mean, I think that I know like the development community. I mean, that's been like, you know, we joke about it, but it's kind of true. Like if you go into like these presentation centers and they're launching or not presentation centers, but like in developer boardrooms, like their, their whole bull thesis is like, well, Canada's population is growing by, you know, this many people and we simply can't build enough housing for them. So like thus, this is a going to be a successful development project. And so, well, if you go all of a sudden you go from, hey, listen, we've been growing by 1.2 million people a year, which is absolutely insane, to all of a sudden zero, zero growth for the next two years. I mean, it has to upend all of your assumptions around your thesis. Okay, so, but I have a question about that quickly, which is, isn't there sort of like a, the wave is sort of already coming, which is to say there wasn't enough housing for those people who came in and so you know aren't i mean not to be glib but those people like those 20 people living in a basement in brampton don't they just go and move into regular more regular housing yeah so i mean this is my my view is like what we're seeing today it's pretty clear now i think for most people in toronto and vancouver in particular like rents are declining okay so they're declining right now so if you go to a scenario where hey listen well rents are declining today by the way, we've got record number of units that are under construction that are in the pipeline and they will be completing over the next 24 months. So I think you're adequately, adequately supplied over the next several years. And then you go, well, and by the way, we're not going to grow our population over the next 24 months. I mean, I, yeah, I think it's, I mean, I'd be curious because like, you know, it's this change that was just announced is definitely not in the Bank of Canada's monetary policy report. How does yeah. that impact the BOC's projections moving forward? Or maybe, just maybe, the the uh, the jumbo rate cut might help to give people a bit more of it if it gets carried through, of course, for uh, to allow them to buy these condos and so forth. I can see yeah. how it goes, sort of yin and yang. But, yeah, but just to clarify, so Rich, Canada's population growth has been running at mm -hmm. just over three percent for the last couple of years. Yeah. So yep. based on the numbers, again, there's a lot of lot of assumptions here. Um, you'd be looking at population growth falling by 0.2% for two years. So an outright decline uh, before rising 0.8% starting in 2027. So we're going to go yeah. basically from 3% down to negative 0.2. Uh, you know, again, uh, tons of assumptions here. I think the big thing is who's actually in government, you know, six, 12 months from now. But um... but but to be clear, though, I mean, you know, we, we got ourselves in a bit of a, a, a pickle, you know, as, as the old guys would, would say. And we need to fix health care. We need to fix education. We need to fix infrastructure. And a lot of it because the demand is too strong for it. And if we do get you know, no to slow or negative growth with their population. It does mean it's going to be less demand. Maybe that gives Canada the opportunity to do what Rich is talking about all the time, you know, increase our productivity by better capital investment across the country. Maybe this gives us the opportunity to do that because what was currently happening was just unsustainable. We already hit a brick wall. So it, I, I think it's actually a, a good move to come out with a policy 
Uh, it's going to hurt a few folks out there. Absolutely. I think real estate in the university towns. So you would imagine that university, I, I know there's multiple universities out there now that are really struggling financially. It's because of the, the less foreign students coming in, you know, less high margin tuition being paid and, and so forth. It, it is going to be, there's going to be a lot of adjustments to take place here. And, but the alternative was it was going to be an even bigger adjustment potentially. So I, I think it's a good move. I think that's what has to happen. Rich, do you, um, do you feel like, again, I know this is so hypothetical and we'll see like their, their ability to actually execute is, is an entirely different thing, but do you feel like this is maybe going too far in one direction? Like, you know, you go from 1.2, which is utterly insane to like zero. It just, it, I mean, uh, you know what? It makes me a huge hypocrite to say this, but yes. And that's what happens when you make reckless decisions is you're driving down, you're driving down the road. And if you oversteer one direction and if it's too hard and, and too fast, you have to then make a almost similarly that that is the political reaction is to go hard and fast the other way. When in reality, how to sort of get yourself out of that situation when driving in the snow or in the sleet or whatever is actually to sort of like, like not, not jerk the steering wheel is to sort of, you know, be, be judicious in that move. It's basically to recalibrate. Um, it's to recalibrate much, much slower, but it, it just, it's, it's sorry to be political. It just stinks of just bad management and, and people who weren't paying attention and now desperate in the polls. I think you are getting, a, a jerk to the other direction, which I guess makes me a hypocrite because I've been saying we've had too much population growth this whole no, time. I, but... I think you're just being a jerk now. <laughs> did you guys I, see that's, the, how uh, I, that's how I feel. Did you see the comment here? Again, you know, it's not typical for a big bank economist to come out and be overly vocal, particularly from a political side. Um, but there was a comment from uh, Bank of Nova Scotia's chief economist, Derek Holt, this morning, uh, where he says, quote, as both an economist and a Canadian, I'm utterly ashamed of how this government ha has so severely botched the immigration file for several years. I'm, I suspect he'll be getting and a call from uh, from uh, <laughs> the higher ups from there. the Gestapo, <laughs> from the Stasi. But, I mean, he's been pretty vocal about um, he's been very vocal over the last couple of years, not only on the immigration file, but on where he feels the BOC should have been, could have been. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just a huge, huge change. So, I mean, this is going to be interesting to how you start plugging in zero immigration into Canada's economic models, which are so heavily reliant on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got to go, know, guys. I, I'm sorry. You got to go? Yeah, I got to go. Yeah, you later. <laughs> you have to sign off without me. I'm sorry. I love you. I'll see you next week, everybody. All right. Well, I guess that's where we're wrapping up the show. Boomer, right. you and I want to close it out? Yes, we'll close it out, man. Let's do it. No immigration? No immigration? Is that a sh short I, short Tim Hortons? I think, you know, you know, Alan, you know, we... The common theme of the biggest challenge or the contributor to the Canadian challenge today has been overgrowth of our population. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how you, you parse it, if it's, you know, different parts of uh, people coming in. And now we're complaining that they've stopped it completely for what two years is the the estimate here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, it, again, no matter what, no matter what the current government is doing, it's always very easy to you know totally. is, you to complain, right? Uh, and now they could say, "Well, we're doing exactly what you told us." You know, I, I know that you know the comment is, "Well, you shouldn't have done it in the first place." It, it doesn't matter; it's already happened. But if you're starting with a clean sheet, if you and I were just running the government from from starts today, uh, and by the way, I could fix a lot of things in one weekend. But we'll, we'll that's for a loony hour social event. But uh, you know, the first thing we would say is, "Hey, we got to control this population growth. How do we do it?" And let's just slam the brakes on because again. Just, just think about how many people, how many listeners here have a GP? How many have a, I'm sorry, how many do not have a doctor for their family? And there's a lot of people out there. Other people, they, they have to go to the ER if, if they're sick. You know, it's just 
one challenge after another. You go to this kind of the public schools and you could have like 40, 45 kids in a classroom, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's just, and then you get inside the class and you realize, oh my God, there's so many challenges. How can the teacher possibly educate, you know, the, the students and then the infrastructure, like I know here in, in our city, there's going to be thousands of new people coming in based on all the, you know, the, the buildings going up. And I'm sure as hell bet you that the, the water and sewage system has not been changed, you know, to accommodate all the stuff that's going to be flowing through. And, uh, but we have all these things happening and, and it is because the population goes. So we do need a pause and maybe I'll change my mind at this because we can do it, but it's, it's no easy way out. We cannot solve this without a bit of pain and mm -hmm. You know, we got to make investments in the economy. That's the way we're doing it. What, what are your thoughts, Steve, initially after hearing, you know, these? Uh, words? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, yeah. I mean, the one thing is is going to be interesting is just kind of, I know Ben's talked about it. He's more of an expert on than I, than I am, but how you actually get people leaving, you know, in the, in the temporary resident program, things of that nature. Um, you You basically show them the door, you know, Ben thinks it's a national security risk. Um, probably tend to agree. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, seems a bit abrasive, but like I said, I think we're probably heading to the polls here in the next six months anyways. So, um, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Okay, man. Good yeah, good place to wrap it up. But, uh, yeah, as always, we appreciate everyone's support. If you got any value or entertainment out of this podcast, leave us a review and share it with a uh, friend or family member and we'll continue to grow it. And got a couple of good guests lined up for the next uh, month or two. So um, yeah, we'll see you next week.